So I was asked to talk about um, insights into the keynote. So I'm not sure exactly what it means. It's not how we told to talk about it originally. I'm not talking about the essence of the keynote, but we'll talk about the keynote either way. What is a keynote? What are keynotes? What do we say? Who says it? Who made it up? So we'll talk a little bit about it. And then I'm going to, uh, if we still have time, to uh, ask a question and suggest an answer and give an insight which is relevant to Tisha B'Av. Okay, so a kina. A kina, as far as I know, the word, the word, the first time the word appears is when David, before he was king, finds out that his best friend Jonathan has been killed in battle and he sings a song. Right? A sad song. Paul McCartney would say, right? Take the sad song and make it better. That's what a sad song is. <laughs> I was around. <laughs> um, we didn't doubt it. Yeah. A kina, a kina is a sad song. It's usually translated as a dirge or an elegy. But since those words don't mean anything to us at all, right? So let's just call it a sad song. That's what it is. It's a sad song. It's a song. It means a song means it's poetry. It's not prose. Akina is always poetry, which means always difficult Hebrew, right? And sometimes it's very, very difficult Hebrew, and that's why it's great to have an English translation because really the Hebrew is almost pointless, right? Unless you've read it many, many years and you understand Hebrew language very well. Um, sometimes you get an idea here, but reading in English is a very, very good idea. Um, I used to read in English beforehand, and then you know, it's not like prayers where there's an advantage of reading in Hebrew. Really advantage, okay? It's a it's a song. It's a sad song. Um, that's what a kina is. Um, th there are in the regular art scroll, the most Ashkenazi versions, uh, forty-five different kina. Right? There's a few we say twice. We say some of them in the evening. We say four or five in the evening after the evening prayer, and then in the morning we say the rest. It takes several hours to say. Um, there isn't really anything else to do on Tisha B'Av. Um, you can't learn, you can't play, you can't eat. So it certainly occupies the, the hours that are until the morning, until the lunch, when you're allowed to really sit, you're sitting on the floor, and there's not much to do in any case. Um, that's the Kinnish we say. Um, some of them are very, very long. Um, I saw the longest one is 264 lines. Um, and some of them are very short. Basically, they usually follow the same pattern. They usually follow the Aleph base pattern. It means it goes Aleph, one line with Aleph, and the next line with the base. Right? Sometimes it has two lines of Aleph, sometimes it has two lines of base, sometimes it has three lines of Aleph, and three lines of base, and it goes up to six lines of Aleph and six lines of base. Uh, and one of them is like 12 lines, but it's not really 12 lines. It's like sort of 12 lines. That's how you get 206, what did it say? 264 lines, which is really the 22 letters of the Aleph base times. Uh, 12, I think, gives you that number. Um, uh, sometimes it's Aleph base Gimel Dal, and sometimes it's Tashrak. Do you want know what Tashrak is? Tashrak is the opposite of Aleph base. The, Aleph, the Hebrew alphabet goes Aleph base Gimel, and backwards it's Tav, Shin, Reish, Kuf. Sometimes the letters are backwards, sometimes it's forwards and backwards. It just has how, uh, how uh, poetic the author was to be able to play around with these things. It's not just a game, right? The, the idea of the writing a poem in Aleph base, right? Sometimes it's easier to remember, right? But that's not really the point. The point of writing something in Aleph base is because it's meant to show that the concept that we're talking about is complete. Com it, it, it covers all aspects. So Ashray, for example. Ashray is what we say every day in prayers, three times a day, right? That goes according to the Aleph base, except there's one letter missed out with a specific reason, but basically it follows the Aleph base. And the idea it's meant to convey is that God's um, looking after the world is in every single aspect, from A to Z, as we would say in English. So it's from Aleph to Tav, is how you say it in Hebrew, and it's every single aspect of our life is governed and controlled by Adam's book. Or Eish Eschayel, you know the song Eish Eschayel? The song that we sing on Friday night, right, also goes from Aleph to Tav. Eish Eschayel is the first, starts with an Aleph, and it's meant to show that the woman that this person is praising, or whatever it's referring to, it's referring to the Torah, it's referring to the Jewish people, but the woman that the man is praising in the song is in all her aspects super. Whether it's from A to Z, Aleph to Tav, every single thing about her is amazing, that's the point. And so the same thing is true about the, the keynote, where we're describing the destruction, the total, absolute destruction of all aspects of our 
physical and spiritual lives as it was when we were here in Eretz Yisrael with the Beis Amigas, we'll talk about it soon, and, uh, and that's the idea. It's based, right, on the Megillas Eicha. Megillas Eicha is the book of Lamentations, as it's called in English, which is a book, a prophetic book, written by Jeremiah the prophet, of which there are, if I'm not mistaken, there are five chapters. The chapter one, two, and four all follow the Aleph base order. Again, in the, there are 22 verses in each chapter. First possibly with the Aleph, the second with the base. It goes through all the letters of the Aleph base. Chapter three is three Alephs, three bases, three gimbals. And this was a scroll that Jeremiah the prophet wrote, prophetically describing the destruction of Jerusalem, the total destruction of Jerusalem. The Jerusalem was an enormous uh, um, metropolis with uh, everything going on there, and he describes it as being empty, nobody there, it's like from one extreme to the other, total destruction. And uh, that idea is conveyed by the other place, and that's why the authors of the Kinois also employ the idea of using this other place. Many of the Kinois, many of these sad songs, also actually employ verses from the, from the book of Eicha. Right? They'll have like, the first line will be the first word of the first chapter, and the second line will be the first word of the second chapter, and that's how, that's how it goes. Uh, many of the Kinois, uh, the authors' names are hinted to, like you see, when you see the Zmirat that we sing on Shabbos, but also if you look carefully, then you'll see the names usually in the spots on the acrostic. And so the first letter is like, like Avraham, right? Like, um, what's it called? Um, uh, Kari Boin Olam, right? Has the letters of Yud Kei Vav Kei, and, uh, and uh, Yudid Nefet, um, Yudid, um, one of them has Yud Yehuda, because it's Yehuda Lady, one's Abraham, it's Ibn Ezra, that's how it's done the same, you'll see the same thing when you read the keynotes, you'll see the same thing, the author's name generally appears somewhere, right? it's not so easy to detect it sometimes, but it usually appears somewhere in the acrostic of the, of the, the song. Okay. Um, Okay, let's just move on to one uh, last point before we actually cover the content. Yes? He's just providing like these articles. Yes, I believe so. I think Amir Rossman has a hundred of these. Okay, so that should be enough. I, nobody knows what happened to the last year. They disappeared. There's none in Yeshiva anywhere. Something happened to them. Actually, some people actually have a custom to bury them every year. You know that? Because they say, well, you need, you're not, not going to use next year. What, you don't believe Mashiach is going to come this year? Right? You, so, so they bury them and they buy new one every year. Well, she was not do well, I don't know what happened last year, maybe somebody did that, but we don't have them. Who started um, the custom of Kinos? What? Who started the custom of Kinos? Is Who it started? Is it European? Well, let's, let, let's, let's see um, whether, whether it, the authorship, right? Mo, there's altogether 45 Kinos in this version. This is a standard version, right? There's another English version written by a rabbi, translated by a rabbi, Ram Rosenfeld. Um, that's also a very commonly used one. Um, it's almost the same. Right, they checked it uh, two nights ago, it's almost the same, there's two extra ones, and that's why the numbers are like pushed away by two all the way through. Um, but they're only extra in certain communities, he writes. In certain communities add, I think, number four and number five, so everything else from four and five becomes two extra. And there's another place where, the, where two are swapped, the orders of two sets are swapped, like 23 and 24 are swapped, and 36 and 36, I don't know exactly what it is. Other than that, it's exactly the same, that's the standard Ashkenazi version of the, of the Kinas. Um, the vast, well, not majority, but the most, many of them, more than 20 of them, were authored by the same person, right? A very, very prolific uh, poet called Rabbi El Elazar HaKaliri. Rabbi Eliezer HaKaliri, okay? Um, who he was is unclear, right? It's a bit, not, Taisfus and Rashi somewhere say that he was the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the famous uh, rabbi of the Rav Shimon of the Mishnah. He had a son called Rabbi El Azar. If you've been to Mehran, you'll see that they're buried next to each other. Rabbi Shimon on the outside, Rabbi El Azar on the inside. Teisfus and Rashi maintain that this Rabbi El Azar HaKaliri is none other than Rabbi Shimon by Yochai. So what does mean? What does Kaliri mean? <laughs> and don't you know? You can guess, I saw in the article, it says it means uh, balm for the eyes. Because um, Kaliri is something you put to uh, <coughs> medicine on your eyes when your eyes are burning you because they've been, you've been, uh, you need to rest them. That's called a, a Kaliri. In other words, right? Um, it's probably a family name. It doesn't mean something, but I don't know what it, uh, in, in, what, what it means in this context. Um, 
So he, he, many, many of the poems that we read, whether they were during the Svichat or whether they were in, in, on, on Chagim, on the festivals, were composed by him. It's a very complicated language. It's very difficult Hebrew. Um, it's very complex, the poetry behind it. Uh, the style is complicated. Um, I say some say he lived a few hundred years afterwards. Right? And that's, like, that's, like, that's like the second century. Remember by Yochai, is like the year I don't know, 100, 100 or something like that CE. Um, after the destruction of the temple, uh, 150, that sort of period. And uh, so we talk about his son, is like the year 200, and we took some other say, put it 500 years later. That's a sort of around that period, that's the earliest. So you asked uh, who invented the, 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 the kinat, the answer really is Rebbe Kaliri, right? Because all the other kinat that we say were all written by people afterwards. Um, some of the later ones that they go through the 10th century, 11th century, 12, 13, 14, even though some, one of the later ones is from the 1500s. So um, it's, it's, it's evolved into what we have today. Um, it might still, we hope it doesn't have to evolve anymore, but at some point it could be that some of the uh, kinos which were written to commemorate the Holocaust will also get in the official versions. Here, there's two in here. Um, there's, I have at home uh, a collection of another six that different people have written. Uh, Rabbi Rosenfeld wrote one. Uh, lots of different people have written. The Rebbe wrote one. Uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Weissmandel wrote one. There's different people have written uh, to come out. Honestly, maybe one day they'll get in. Maybe hopefully it won't be necessary to put in anyway. But I don't know. Um, my, my, I assume that the official version that we have today was established sometime in the 1600s in what we would call the Vad Arba Aroksos which was a body of rabbis that convened once or twice a year in Poland and, uh, and uh, basically decide, made decisions for the Jewish community, which was in Poland, in Germany, in Lithuania, in Ukraine, and that was called the, the Community of the Four Lands, and they basically set the pattern for Ashkenazi Jewry. Exactly, the Swabi also say Kinois, and they should know that many of the poets of the Ashkenazi uh, um, Kinois are actually worth Sephardi rabbis, right? Reb Shlomi Ibn Gabiro, a very, very famous uh, Sephardi uh, Spanish rabbi, he wrote one of the, one of the ones we say at night. Uh, Rob Ibn Ezra was also one of the famous Sephardi poets. Yehuda Levi is the most famous uh, poet of all time, probably. And, uh, and he also wrote some of the, the and they're all Sephardi, and I imagine, I don't know, I imagine Sephardi would say this, their Kinois as well, it's, right? Um, and then there's a few uh, not so famous Ashkenazi rabbis like uh, Rameir Rottenberg, who is the Rebbe of the Rush. He also wrote one of the speeches. They say most, most of the people who wrote Kinot wrote one or two, but, not, but the major contributor is clearly Rabbi Eleza Akaliri. Okay, so let's go to the content and discuss that a little bit because that's really what's important. Like we said, they're all sad songs. Most of them are general sad songs in the sense that they're compositions describing the temple, describing the land of Israel, and describing the, 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 the loss, the destruction, uh, the suffering, the pain, the torture, um, the death. Um, that's the general picture. Um, there are, I would say like 30 of them are like that. Each one in its own way. You know, one of them, for example, will talk about uh, the contrast between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Which kingdom suffered more? Right? If you know your Jewish history a little bit, right? The northern kingdom, which Israel was split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom went to exile about 150 years before the southern kingdom, and there was sort of like a, a, a debate between representatives of the two kingdoms, which one suffered more. There's another one that talks about the 24 uh, groups of priests. The, all the priests were split into four groups, and each, each one has a, is represented in the poem describing what they lost by the destruction of the temple. Um, there's others describe uh, contrast, uh, the, 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 the ex exodus with the exile, in a very interesting poetic way. Like who led us out of Egypt and who led us out of Jerusalem. Right, who led us out of Egypt was Moses and Aaron. Who led us out of Jerusalem? Nebuchadnezzar and Titus. And, and it goes through like 20 or 30 lines contrasting the glory and the amazing uh, divine presence that we had when we left Egypt and contrasting that to what happened when we left Jerusalem going into exile. Those are the more general, let's just give you a few examples of, of what's going on and what we say. There's also a few... Uh, very, very personal accounts. I don't mean personal that the person actually went through it, 
but it's just a story, a very specific story, like there's a story uh, of the two children of Rabbi Shmuel, who was the high priest, who was captured by Romans and by two different Romans, and and they uh, and they were brought uh, bought. Sorry, they were bought by two different Romans on the slave market in Rome. And one's talking to his friend, you should know this beautiful, pretty girl I brought from Jerusalem, and, uh, and you've never seen anything like it in your life. And then the other one's describing what you, you don't know what I just brought. I've just I never seen such a handsome man in my life. And they said, well, it would be a great idea if we, if we married them off. And, and they had children, and they're, wow, and then we could sell, you know, they would have these, whatever, we'd have the, these uh, beautiful slave children, which would then be worth, worth a lot of money. And so they said, okay, let's, let's get it. And so they, they put them in a the room, and they're hoping that they'll have, uh, you know, what boys and girls do when they get in a room together, unfortunately, right? But then the ones, they're in the corners, uh, each one is crying their eyes out, thinking, well, I'm a descent of Aaron, going to have relations with this slave girl, right? And the girl's thinking the same thing, well, I'm a descendant of Miriam, I'm going to have relations with this, with this slave girl. And in the morning, they realize that this is brother and sister, and they, they embrace and die. That's the story, okay? So that's, that's, the, that's like a very, um, I say personal, in sense. it's not describing the, the destruction on a large scale, on the, on a, uh, uh, what's the, a, a macro scale, but the micro scale is a very, very personal story as well. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of personal uh, tragedies and sufferings that went on at the same time. Each, each person's suffering is a, whole, is a whole story to itself. And then you have the other stories that you mentioned there, the boys and girls who were on boats, on boats, and they, they realized they were being taken as sex slaves, and they decided to commit suicide in the sea, and that is sort of described in detail as well. Or Nebuzaradan, who was the who was the general of the of the of the Babylonian army, who comes into the temple, and uh, and uh, he sees his blood boiling on bubbling on the floor, and he wants to know what's going on, and eventually kills tens of thousands of priests. And, the, and, the, and it's still bubbling, thinking that this would atone. And, and it, in, in the end, they realized this was, this was the blood of Zechariah, the prophet, who had been killed in the temple many, many, many years before, like a, over 150 years before this story. And this eventually atoned for them. And, and he turned to God and said, how long are we going to wipe out the Jewish people entirely? And these are these, these, like those stories like that. Several of the of the, of the <coughs> that we say are dedicated to the crusade, right? The, particularly the first crusade of 1096. Um, I think the reason why they focus on the First Crusade, not because the First Crusade was more horrific than the others, but it was a bigger shock. I mean, the Ashkenazi Jewry had lived in relative security for hundreds and hundreds of years um, in, uh, in, in Europe, but from the time that they were freed Roman slaves after the destruction until this was really the first catastrophe they had suffered. And it was the beginning of many, many hundreds of years of, you know, ending in... in uh, 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 1939, basically, that's what started in 1096. That's the suffering of Ashkenazi Jewry. It was a tremendous shock and uh, prompted many compositions, which at least three are clearly compositions about the Crusade. I think there's another one or two as well. The language and description of what's going on. So those, that's a lot of what, what's going on. So the most, again, on the most part, like 30 or so are general compositions discussing the temple. Um, um, in detail, uh, the loss of the different parts of the, of, of the temple, loss of its influence in, 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 in spiritual and physically. But then there's a few which, in my mind, are easy to relate to. When they become stories about somebody and going into detail about stories, I, first of all, Hebrew is generally easier to, easier to, easier to, to understand. So if you're reading Hebrew, it makes it easy. And uh, it becomes much more personal when it's described in detail. And those are the ones which, just personally for me, I get more out of. Um, relating to them. Okay, there's also one about the ten martyrs, of famous ten fa famous rabbis who were murdered around the time of the destruction of the temple. Right, the story gives the impression was all at the same time, but it's just poetic license, I believe. It's not really true. Right, they died over a period of probably about 50, 60 years. They were killed by the Romans. The Romans killed tens, hundreds of thousands of people, possibly millions of people in the country at the time. Right, but these were killed as examples, like in the Kiva. Right? He wasn't killed in battle. He wasn't killed when the town was captured, as was usually. It was, he was taken as an example because he was to teach, tried to teach Torah, and that's why he was, he was uh, the same thing as with, the, with the others as well. So that's also described in detail. Um, what else? There's another one I wanted to mention. Ah, uh, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Um, also, there's a poetic eulogy 
of the prophet Jeremiah. Right, the, prophet, the story in the, in the prophet says that Jeremiah gave a eulogy for the king Yoshio, right, who was the last great famous tzaddik king of the kingdom of, 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 of the Jewish king. He had there were other kings afterwards, but he was the other kings were very short lived. Basically, the last great king we had was Yoshio, and he was killed in battle by by uh, Paro, the king of Egypt. And the prophet it says in the in the, in the, in the Navi that the prophet Jeremiah eulogized him. He's at his burial, he gave a talk about him. Now, I don't believe that what we say on Tisha is an actual version. Oh, that's what it says it is, right? You know, I think that's just a poet's license line. And this is what Jeremiah said about Yoshio, and then he talks about him. It's something that he might have said, could have said, should have said, whatever it is. But that's another again in detail about the death of this great Zadig and what we lost. Okay. Now, there's a section at the end which are all about Tzion, right? The very famous one is written by uh, Yehuda Alevi. Tzion, Halei Tishali, Eshleim Asibach. Tzion, 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 Halei Tishali. You know the song? It comes from this poem, this uh, sad song of Yehuda Alevi. Yehuda Alevi, basically the last ten or so kinos that we say are focused on, they're like, they're more positive. Instead of being focused on the destruction, although it's very difficult to get away from that on Tisha B'Av, um, it's talking about the great positive aspects that Jerusalem and the land of Israel and the base of Middash gave to the Jewish people, gave to the world, uh, both physically and spiritually. What, did, what, 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 what is there here? What's this special land give us? It's the, the air that we breathe, the stones that we mine here, uh, the sacrifices, the sky, the birds, Everything about this country is unique, and the, and the songs describe who's buried here, um, uh, etc. The, the different, very amazing, positive attributes and aspects that we have in the land of Israel and in Yerushalayim and in the base of Middash in particular. And that's what these last ten uh, um, kinos are about. Uh, each one, again, in their own style, written by each one by different people, but they're all addressing Tzion. Tzion meaning Yerushalayim, the base of Mikdash. And, um, but the sun that always bothered me for years, until, until I had to give this class, which, uh, you know, speak about the Kinoi, so it's, now I, I, I investigate a little bit. There's one Kina, which is the second to last, it's a very, very uh, moving Kina, very, very heartrending, and it's written by Romer Rottenberg, who was a Rebbe of the Rosh, Ben Rosh, yeah. Uh, in the 13, in the 1200s, and it's written to commemorate the burning of 24 wagon loads of handwritten Talmuds in Paris. Um, whatever, it's a long story. You can read it in the art scroll here. That's exactly what the story is. Um, it's a very good handbook. You've really got to spend a lot of time to read all the introductions. Um, it's a very um, important story. Um, Twelve something or other, the Pope decreed that all the Talmuds in the whole of Christi all Christian countries should be burnt uh, because of the claim that they had anti-Christian ideas in them. The only country that actually carried it out was France. Um, and the 24. Now in those days, you didn't you just go to buy a printed chasse. Everything was handwritten. 24 um, handwritten, 24 wagons of handwritten Talmuds were burnt in Paris, in Champs Elysees, in the Louvre where the Mona Lisa is, right? Um, and uh, because of that, basically, rabbis of France left France. There was, if there's no books, there's no, no way to teach, there's no students, and everybody left. And maybe the French were happy, I don't know. That that's, was the consequence of it. And what bothered me is it looks out of place. You know, to my mind, if you look at the whole structure of the Kimais, I would expect that to be together with... Um, uh, the people, the, boy, the boys and girls who committed suicide, or with the, the Crusades, right? You know, it's the same sort of period, maybe 150 years later, but it's the same, you know, the same sort of uh, place, the same sort of period, uh, and uh, it didn't fit in with all the, what they call the Tzionim. The Tzionim are the, is the name given to the last ten or so of the keynotes, which are designed at the end, all talking about the, the, the longing for to come back, you know, Yehuda Levi's longing to kiss the stones of Yerushalayim and uh, to breathe the air 
and uh, to walk the footsteps of King David. That's the longing of the of these last. And all of a sudden, uh, two before the end, you get this horrific story about the burning of the Talmud in France. So, I saw an answer, which is probably why, you know, when I did the research, I didn't like it at all. The, the, you know, just the style of, of rhyme is similar. You know, the meat, the, 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 the meat is like, you know, it's a bit of a weak reason to stick something in the middle, just because it, you know, rhymes with your jest. For the Elysium, where's the... I'm going to get to Elysium in a minute. Elysium is the last one, right? That also seems to be an exception, I'm going to get to that in a second, right? Uh, but it's at least about Sion, right? Elitia is the last one. Elitia, which is Sion, should cry out. We'll talk about that in a second. We'll get there. We've got time. Yes. So, so I, I stood through all the keynotes. I went through each one to see which of them have positive endings. Which of them end with horror, right? Pain, suffering, torture. And which of them have got positive light? Right? Some of them do, some of them don't. Now, a positive light just means, uh, you know, please God bring an end to our suffering. That's also positive, right? Um, or uh, the, the contrast between leaving Egypt and leaving Yerushalayim. So the last line says, Sasson uh, v'simcha bishuvi Yerushalayim. And it will be happy and rejoicing when we come back to Yerushalayim. So it's just one line, but it's, it's turned the, 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 the sad song and made it happy, right? And uh, and some do, some don't. I went through them as well. In the first uh, 30 or so, you would say like 20 have got a happy ending, and the like 10 don't. And the last 10, constantly, each one of them have got this amazingly positive ending. This is what Yerushalayim used to be, and now we've lost it all, and, we, and I'll just read out one or two of them, right? I'll just pick one at random. I, this is the, uh, the end of number 38. I, uh, I yearn and languish for consolation. Oh, that the loud proclamation of the herald of redemption be heard in my ears and yours. Wake up to greet your beloved. Shake yourself from the dust to the ground when he, God, returns to your palace. Right? That's a beautiful end. Right? You know, it's not all so great at the beginning, but it's got a beautiful ending. Right? And beautifully, well, I mean, they're all beautiful, poetic, in a poetic sense, but beautifully positive and yearning for the redemption. Right? And I saw and I went through, I researched through each one, starting like from number uh, I don't know, down, starting from 28, 26, one after another, one after another. There's all got these and then I went to this one, Shali, uh Baish, which is the one here it is. Number forty one. O Torah, by fire consumed, seek the welfare of your mourners, of those who yearn to lodge in the courtyard of your dwelling. How did it come to pass, O holy Torah, that you were given by God that all consuming fire should be consumed by man made fires? And yet those alien intruders who burnt you escaped unscathed from your flaming coals. Right? That's the description of these 24 wagon loads being burnt. Then I looked at the end. And the end. May the rock of salvation comfort you according to the days of your affliction. And may he return the captivity of the tribes of Yeshua and exalt your degraded ones. Once again, you will adorn yourself with ornaments of scarlet. And you will take up the tambourine and go out in a circle, dance and rejoice with your dancing. At that time, my heart will be uplifted when your rock will be lightened to you to brighten your darkness and to illuminate your gloom. So I feel that the reason why this kina was put in two before the end is because of its positive ending. I mean, the message you get is not about gloom, it's not about destruction. That's what we're going through, but that's not the point, right? As uh, Rabbi, um, Rabbi Elbaz said, he mentioned the Chazal, Chal hamis abel al churban Yerushalayim zoiche v'raya bebinyana. Okay, now, I don't think he translated it accurately, right? He translated the way it's usually translated. Actually, it's as follows. He said, those who mourn over the destruction of Shaddai will merit to live to see its rebuilding. Correct? That's what he said. Okay? It's not really. It doesn't say, Yizke, 
the year after Binyana, which would be the normal say, he will merit Yizke in the future. The year after, he says, it says, Zoyche Veroya, he merits and sees in the present, which is weird, right? A person who mourns the destruction merits and sees its building. So obviously the simple way to translate it and to understand it is what Rabbi Elbaz was saying. And obviously that's true. But the nuance in this slightly strange way of writing in Hebrew is saying another point. Which is, the point of mourning is not to focus on what we lost. Right? It's very important to focus on what we lost in order to get the message. Right? When we appreciate what we had, what there was, and how we lost it all, and that pushes us to reconnect. A, to pray that we should get it back. B, to do tshuva in order to get it back. But even more importantly, I think this is more important, and then those are two very positive, out, positive outcomes of focusing on what we lost, right? Because we don't want to lose anymore. We don't want to suffer anymore. So what do we do? You just sit and think about it and get depressed. It's not going to get you anywhere. If you therefore pray or do tshuva, but there's more to it than that. Because when we're focusing on what we lost, there's really one thing we lost. What I mean is one thing we lost. We, we have, since the destruction of the temple, gone through persecution, crusades, inquisitions, antifadas, suffering, death, pain, torture, loss, poverty, disease, Right? And if you get more personal, you have people who are suffering in the sense that they, 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 they have illness, they are ch childless, they are suffering in their emuna, um, they, they, they can't learn. And, and, and all of these things are symptoms of one thing, which is Golos Ashkina. The fact is we're not close to God. It's just one thing. That's, it's not the destruction of the building. Right? That's the day we focus on. Right? But that's also a symptom. The fact that Titus was able to go into that building and destroy it, and he wasn't dropped dead on the, on, on, as he walked into the Holy of Holies, as the Kayan God would do, right? is because the Shekhinah wasn't there. The Shekhinah means our connection with God in this world was lost. And because of that, all of that whole list, and you can make this longer and longer, of hundreds and hundreds of different communities, thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people who have suffered, are all because of the God of Shekhinah, and the fact that we don't have this connection with God. And if we did have that, right, then we'd have everything. We would have blessing, we would have redemption, we would have a temple, we would have sacrifice, we would have forgiveness, we would have peace, and serenity, and, 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 and wealth, and success, and everything else that goes along with being at home. Right? It's the same thing, just imagine yourself, you have a couple, right? When they have a hole, they build, they everything, they have peace, they have serenity, they have a family, they have a, they have a roof over their head, they're happy, everything goes on. And when they separate and they don't live together, then their whole life is ruined. It's just one thing we're looking for. But I, I believe that when you, once you internalize that message, then you've already connected. Once you see what we're missing, what we've lost, that self is already making a connection. And that's what, because we're mourning the loss of connection, the first step to connection is to realize what, what do we get from this connection? What does it mean to be connected to God? What, what, what do I get by it? That's ready to search. I'm ready on the way up. And that's why I say, call ha this Abel al Yudra, Zoyche Beroy in the present tense, not in the future, in the future too, right? But it's already a partial Gula, it's a very partial redemption in itself, in the fact you're able to. And that's why so many of our, of our keynotes end on a positive note, especially as we've gone through the war. Now, once you get through to the end, it's just one after another. Like I said, that's why I think that's why number 42 is describing the destruction of these, these books, which itself is a horrific event. But the way the author, why the author did that, I don't know, right? Why that specific one is like that, I don't know. Right? Uh, but, but at least now I have the, the keynote to go by, I see the beautiful way he ends off, the positive note, and that's really what the keynote the end is. Okay, so one last point about Elitia. Right? Elitia is a very uh, heart-rending song, because, not so much because of the words, because the words of all the keynotes are heart-rending. It's just a tune which is sung to at the end where everyone sings it together, and, uh, and um, I'll just read out what the words, right? And this struck me as well because it's not very positive, right? The last one, you think you end on a positive note. 
Wail, O Zion, and her cities like a woman suffering from birth travail, like a maiden girded in sackcloth, lamenting the husband of her youth. Very, very descriptive. Very heartrending. The idea that a woman who was single, right, was engaged to somebody, and he's died, and now she's sitting crying in black sackcloth for her beloved who is not going to return. Right. Although it doesn't say so clearly, right? Why is she mourning, lamenting the husband of a youth if he's going to come back? At least she presumed that he's dead. And then it goes on to describe all the awful destruction and pain, suffering and torture that we went through, and really ends like that. And I was shocked, you know, this doesn't fit with my idea of the, of the gradual positiveness, okay? So I saw a very nice note over here in the art scroll. The opening line of the keynote, which is repeated either as a refrain or whatever, provides a ray of hope. Why is it a ray of hope? Wail, O Zion, and the city is like a woman suffering from birth travail. Or what? You might have ever heard a woman in, in birth, right? Okay, giving birth, but it's very, sometimes it's very dramatic, right? It's very, very painful, right? Right? I'm going to take the joke. Right? 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 <laughs> We're not, this isn't the bed. Right? What? We don't know. We don't, you don't know the, the joke? We don't know how, oh. don't know how, 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 how painful it is. Right. But as I said, one day you will know, uh. right? You'll be outside the, 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 the good joke of birth like this. The woman's inside the room. This is how it is usually in the, in, the, in the religious circle. The woman's in the room giving birth. After a certain point where the man's not hard to touch her anymore, and then he goes out of the room and he says, Lam Natseh. This is how it is. This is how I did it, right? Lam Natseh is a prayer, the prayer that we say every morning that Hashem should help you in times of distress. Okay? The custom is to say it 12 times, and if you say it slow enough, by the time you get to the end, the baby will be born. Then we'll be fine. Okay? So you're walking up and down saying Lam Natseh, and the nurse comes out and he says, Mazel Tov, you had a baby girl. The father says, Oh, Thank God, she's never going to have to go through what I just went through. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're right. We're not in the place. We don't really know what it's like, right? right? But I know when I had that sophisticated arm, and it was, I was crying. Right? It was Erev Pesach, and I'd done some move doing Pesach cleaning. I dislocated my arm. It was, it was, it was excruciating. I said, "That's what childbirth is like." <laughs> and it doesn't just go away by going like that. You know, putting your, that's what I did, you're not supposed to, the doctor said, you're not supposed to put it back, you're supposed to be in excruciating pain and go to the hospital, but I didn't do that, I just went like that, and it went back in the and then it was fine. Anyway, he says, that's what it's like having a baby. So just a second, so after all says, yes, it's painful, and the woman screaming, and that's what we're doing on Tisha But I know that's a positive outcome. It's not like the woman who's sitting there crying and good and sackcloth lamenting the husband of you. Well, it could be one way or the other. You can look at Tisha two ways. Right? You could be distressed, you could be crying, you said there's no hope, how are we going to get out of this? Or, you could be like a woman who's crying in childbirth, knowing that there's a ray of hope. It's a very painful hope, no, but in the end, it's going to be good. It's not just it's going to be good, this is the way it's going to be good. Right? This is going to create the good at the end. Right? And that's why I said, that's really what connection is about, it's about creating that connection, at least the first stage of connection, when you realize what we've lost, how much we had, how much we suffered, how much we could have. Right? That is already a yearning for a connection, and that's the reason why it really is very positive. Which is why after the keynote, we get up, we sit. There's even a custom in Spain. I heard when I was in Gibraltar, there used to be a custom in Sp uh, Spanish Jews to whitewash the house. It means to paint it. Right? So, right? They used to paint the houses white on Tisha B'Av afternoon to get ready for Mashiach. And that was the point we really believe. We really believe. Why should he come? Because if you've done a prophet Tisha B'Av, right? As, the, as, the, as that quote was, Karl Hamis Abel al Yerushalayim, If we did it properly, right, which is what God's waiting for us to make that yearning for that connection, then once we once we've done that push, then Hakadosh Baruch Hu will push towards us, and that's why we're going to get ready. Oh, you can't come in this messy house with all dirty marks on the wall. That was the custom. They used to whitewash. That means you used to paint the walls white until you're about to. That's why we went to fill it on Tisha B'Av afternoon, right? Even though, as Rabbi Elbaz pointed out, the worst part of the destruction was on Tisha B'Av afternoon, right? Okay, that's another shit, right? Well, that's the, the, the idea that we've come through the positive and taken it out. And that's why I think that if you just to sum up, summarize, I think we don't say take a sad song and make it better, right? Which really means to take a sad song and change it, 
right? That's what he means, right? That's not, that's, that's not what we're doing. We sing a sad song, and it makes it better. The singing of the sad song is you really appreciate what you had, what you could have, that itself is making your situation better. Please God, I could smoke, should make our situation so much better even before then, and we'll have to sing any more sad songs. Yes, yeah, sorry, you've got a question. Uh, yeah, uh, is coming. But, um, the 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 Nigan of El Incion, yes. where uh, who composed the, the tune and also why was it accepted that we could sing it? because uh, we don't sing specifically Yeah, but you're a sad song. So right. sing a sad song, sad song, sad tunes, they're just sad tunes. Right. Right? We sing the Eicha. Right. And I, I had a Swahili friend who thought that the Ashkenazi tune by Eicha was a very happy tune. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's it, by an Ashkenazi mind it's associated with the sad tunes so automatically we feel sad, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's actually an Ashkenazi cousin, which I didn't know until this week, <coughs> to sing the Chadaidi on the Shabbos before Tisha B'av to the tune of El In yeah. Israel, they don't do it. Because in Israel, the little one holds, you shouldn't do any form of mourning in, in, in public on Shabbos, and that's why the custom is not to. In the Chutzlaret, the custom used to be to not wear Shabbos clothes on the Shabbos of, right, that was the custom in Chutzlaret. So there's different customs of what you could and what you couldn't do.